What were our three key words last night for those of you that were here? There were three words. What were they? Yes. Youth trumps wisdom. Yes, you nailed it. Absolutely. Syllogism, syllogism, syllogism. What was that syllogism? Not awe. I tell you, I know it every time. You're just anxious to hear that awe. Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. What's our conclusion? Therefore, abortion is wrong. And we talked about how that syllogism keeps you on message. People bring up all kinds of side issues that have nothing to do with the central argument. And by having a syllogism, you can bring it back to the question, what is the unborn? And by framing the debate around that question, we bring clarity. People will bring up back alley abortions, forcing morality. Oh, that's just your religious view. Oh, you don't respect women. Oh, you want a war on women. Oh, you don't trust women. And the list goes on and on. None of which have a thing to do with the morality of abortion. The morality of abortion starts with the question, what is the unborn? And we spent last night defending that syllogism with science and philosophy. And we gave you a one minute soundbite for when Aunt Betty shows up at Thanksgiving next year and she wants to know why you're pro-life. And she's going to be ready to really give it to you in between bites of turkey and stuffing. And you're going to say to her in under a minute, Aunt Betty, I am pro-life because the science of embryology teaches us that from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct living and whole human being. And not only that, Aunt Betty, there's no essential difference between that embryo you were and the adult you are today that would justify killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying you could be killed then but not now. That little soundbite is not going to cause her to fall on her knees at that moment and confess that she is now pro-life. By the way, there is no sinner's prayer for converting to the pro-life position. <laughs> What will happen, though, is you will put a pebble in her shoe. Have you ever had a pebble in your shoe, as Greg Kokel points out? A pebble in your shoe will wear on you and wear on you until you deal with it. And what we're doing is giving people something to think about. We aren't going to worry about whether we close the deal. We're going to give them something to think about that's going to rattle around in their head and not be easily dismissed. So that's what we covered last night. Today, we're going to do three things. First, we're going to look at the biggest objection to the pro-life view, and in fact, I think it's the biggest objection to Christianity in general today, that being the concept of relativism. And I'll talk about why that view is prevalent and why it doesn't work and why it should never silence you as a Christian. Then we're going to look at reproductive technologies. This is not something you hear talked about in Christian circles very often, but I'm telling you, we are doing our fellow brothers and sisters a disservice if we haven't thought through these things biblically. We're going to talk about technologies that allow couples who are struggling with infertility to have children. And we're going to talk about are those okay? What's the fence posts we should draw around them? Then we're going to talk about one that will be relevant to all of us. And that is, what do we do when we approach the end of life, either our own or more recent or more likely to happen in the near future to us, to a loved one? How do we approach that? How do we deal with questions about is it okay to withdraw treatment? Is it ever okay to withhold food and water? Is it okay to dial up morphine to control pain even if that might seem like it might hasten death? <clears throat> we'll look at that. And then we're going to end the day in what will be the fuzziest part of our time together. 
I'm real clear on all the other stuff. Our last session, the reason why it's going to seem a little fuzzy, the Christian community is still trying to catch up and think through this. And that has to do with the whole topic of biotechnology, specifically biochemistry. What, what are we to think as Christians about treatments that not merely repair the body, <clears throat> but enhance it? What do we do with that? And what about the whole transhumanist movement <clears throat> that is trying to take human nature and leapfrog it forward in the evolutionary cycle? Guys like Gregory Stock and others who were writing about this. We'll talk about that, and there will be a little bit of that where we're going to be scratching our heads saying, I don't know that I fully know what I think on this. Be patient with yourself. We're all scratching our heads on some of this because we're still learning what's out there, and we'll go through it and give you some notes that will help you through it. All right. Tell me the difference between these two claims. Chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Statement two, it is wrong to torture toddlers for fun. Statement one, chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Statement two, it is wrong to torture toddlers for fun. Is there a difference between those two? What's the difference between them? One's opinion, one's fact, what else? One's a preference, okay. One is moral, the other is not, okay. I saw another hand over here. All right, I didn't see a hand. Anybody else? Difference between those two claims. When I said chocolate was better than vanilla, some of you got fire in your eyes and you were thinking them are fighting words. Let's go right now. I could just see it. When I claim that chocolate is better than vanilla, by the way, that's a lie. I don't believe it, but I'll just use it for the illustration. When I claim chocolate is better than vanilla, I'm making a claim about likes and dislikes. I am not making a claim about what's right and wrong regardless of likes and dislikes. I'm telling you what's true for me, the subject. So it's a subjective claim, a claim about me, the subject, that may not be true for you. But when I make a moral claim, I am not talking about what I like or prefer. I'm talking about what's true and right regardless of my preferences. My father-in-law is 82. He buys Corvettes quite regularly. By the way, he skis, he surfs, he rides horses, and he doesn't just ski, he races. I mean, he's insane. Uh, he just bought a new vet. I know where the keys are to it. I'll be out in California soon enough, and I would like to go charging up PCH in that new 2000. 16 vet, and uh, that thing, that's, he's, he's got the, you know, the nice, near, it's 500 horsepower under the hood. I mean, it, it's a screamer. I'm not going to do that, though. Why not? I'd like to, but I won't. Tell me why. Because it would be wrong. Unfortunately, we are part of a culture that doesn't know the difference between a claim about likes and dislikes and a claim about what's right and what's wrong. They confuse preference claims with moral claims. Let me give you an example. Have you ever seen this bumper sticker? Maybe you have. Don't like abortion? Question mark. Don't have one. Have you, have you seen that sticker? Yeah. What does that bumper sticker do to the pro-life argument? Think about our syllogism. It's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion's wrong. What does that bumper sticker do to our truth claim? Changes it from a truth claim to what? A preference subjective one, exactly. Try this. Don't like slavery? Don't own a slave. Don't like spousal abuse? Don't beat your spouse. Is that going to work? No, it's not going to work at all. But yet when it comes to abortion, people take our moral claim and change it to a preference claim. Pope Benedict put it real well. He said that in the 21st century, we suffer under a dictatorship of relativism. 
And if you can tolerate a Presbyterian who attends a Southern Baptist church interpreting the Pope, here's what he meant. (laughs) Our culture has become so permissive, you can marry your canary if you want to. But the minute you claim your moral or religious view is true with a capital T, we are not going to tolerate you. Theologian D.A. Carson calls this the new tolerance. And here's what Carson means. This is from his book, The Intolerance of Tolerance. The old view of tolerance went like this. I think you're wrong. Your view makes no sense to me, but I respect you as a person. You are free to take a seat at the table and get your view out there like everybody else gets to do. I tolerate you as a person, but I don't tolerate all ideas as being equally valid. Now, as Christians, can we buy into that view of tolerance? Absolutely. Here's the new view of tolerance, says Carson. The new view of tolerance is this. All ideas are equally valid. And if you say differently, we will not tolerate you. Why is the coexist bumper sticker on every other car you see today? Do we need a coexist bumper sticker in America? No, you don't. You know why? Because you don't get killed for believing the wrong thing, do you? You know where you need a coexist bumper sticker? Iran, Saudi Arabia. That's where you need it. So what is the point of that sticker? It's not the old tolerance. It's the new tolerance. All religions are equally valid. All religions are equally true. That's what it means to be tolerant. Now, folks, I don't, I'm going to assume there's no flaming atheist here today, but if you were one, you could refute that coexist sticker. You don't even have to be a Christian to refute it. Here's why. As Greg Kokel points out, when you die, you either go to heaven, go to hell, go to purgatory, get reincarnated, or rot in the grave. But you're not going to do them all at the same time, are you? We know for a fact that all religions can't be equally true. But relativism demands that we view them that way. So let's define relativism, and then I'll give you some more examples of it. Relativism is the belief that right and wrong on religion or ethics is either up to the individual or their society. Right and wrong is up to the individual or to his society. There are no overarching principles that we're supposed to get in line with. You just have personal preferences or societal agreements. That's relativism. I'll give you some examples of it. Two years ago, I was a very naughty boy. I left church before the sermon. And I I think I had a good reason. You don't know this about me, but... I have this thing when I buy new clothes, I can't wear them until they've been washed about 20 times. They itch. They feel just bad on my skin. So all my t-shirts are threadbare. Um, All the most comfortable clothes I have have been just obliterated in the, the wash cycles. And I was wearing a newer shirt and it had not gone through enough cycles. And then what happens is once they feel comfortable to me, I get them all starched up and they look real nice and they feel fine. Well, this shirt wasn't cooperating, and I'm in Sunday school dying. I said to my wife, you go on to church. I'm going home. I'm going to change clothes. I'll come right back. Well, I got home, and I decided, well, I'm already here. I might as well check a football score. God will forgive me. And um, I turned on the TV, and I got Fox News, and they were talking about Tiger Woods. You're aware of Tiger Woods' challenges in his marriage? They were doing a panel discussion. And here was the topic. What does Tiger Woods need to do to fix himself, given his marital infidelities? The first panelist said something like, well, he's got to get in touch with his core values. If he can center himself on his core values, then he'll be all right. I'm like, get in touch with his core values? That's why he's twisted right now. They're bad. He doesn't need to get in touch with them. He needs new ones. Then the next guy, I think it might have been Bill Crystal, said, well, he needs some, I think he needs some couch time. Then they came to Brit Hume. Do you know who Brit Hume is? 
Now, I want you to get this. Brit Hume is on a panel where he's been asked to weigh in on what Tiger needs to get fixed. All right? He's been asked to comment on it. He didn't impose it. He was asked. Here's what Brit Hume said. Tiger Woods will recover in his golf game. But he's not going to recover in his personal life if he doesn't reject Buddhism, which can't save him, and turn to the God of Christianity, who alone offers forgiveness and reconciliation. Outside of that, I don't see how he recovers. What do you think happened within seconds on the blogosphere? How dare Brit Hume claim his religion is better than Tiger Woods? How dare he be so intolerant? Nobody said... Tiger Woods is wrong about Christianity. Here's the historical reason why he's wrong. Here's the theological reason why he's wrong. Here's the philosophical reason why he's wrong. No, they just were mad that he claimed to be right. Say hello to the new tolerance. This is precisely what D.A. Carson was talking about. Precisely. There uh, is a singer... Some of you have heard of him by the name of Nick Cannon. Does that name ring a bell at all? He's a rapper. Ten years ago, he wrote a song called Can I Live? It's about his own mother. She was 17 and pregnant in the abortion clinic, ready to abort him. And at the last minute, she walks out at age 17. And Nick, thinking back on that, wrote a song as if he were speaking to his mother from the womb. And it's a pretty compelling tune. Go to YouTube and check it out. Not now, but when you get home tonight. If you want to live, you will not do it now. In the song, though, there's a line that got a lot of people angry. Here's the line. Mom, I hope you make the right decision and don't go through with the knife incision. Yeah. Whoa. How many people do you think confronted Nick Cannon and said, well, you're really wrong about the nature of abortion. It doesn't dismember a living human being. Did anybody challenge him that way? No. What do you think they were angry about? That he claimed to know what the right decision was. Hello, new tolerance. Hello, relativism. And this is what you and I face. So let me give you the three types of relativism you'll encounter in the culture. We'll then look at how we respond to it. How do we respond to it in a way that won't trip us up? The first type of relativism you're going to encounter is what we call society does relativism. And this comes from the book by Francis J. Beckwith and Greg Kolkel called Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. Great title. Here's what we mean by society does relativism. You, the Christians, say, well, you know what? There are objective moral rules we ought to pay attention to. And your secular friend says, well, pff, what do you mean? Cultures don't agree on what's right and wrong. Why, some cultures say you can have five wives. Some say you can have only one. What do you mean there's objective moral rules? How can there be objective moral rules when people disagree on what they are? That's known as society does relativism. Now, a couple of things to know about this. We mentioned one last night. How does it follow that because people disagree, nobody's right? Did they once disagree on the earth being flat around? Yes. Did they once disagree on slavery? Yes. Did they once disagree on women having the right to vote? Of course. Did it mean there were no right answers? Of course not. So the fact that people disagree doesn't mean anything other than they disagree. But C.S. Lewis makes another point. He says cultures don't disagree as much as you think they do. Yeah, there may be culture that says you can have five wives. Your culture says you can have one. But no culture says you can take any woman you want and force her to be your wife. There's another point Lewis makes. Sometimes the disagreement is not over morals, it's over facts. Do any of you listen to Dennis Prager on the radio? Do you know that name? Can I encourage you to start listening to Dennis Prager? He's on at noon nationally. Um, he's on at the same time that you get Rush and I forget who else. But Dennis Prager is easily the most thoughtful guy on radio. 
He's not a believer. He's a conservative Jew. But I will tell you, if you want to learn to think, start listening to him. And Dennis and I once had an exchange on the issue of abortion. And I want you to determine if you think our difference was moral or factual. Dennis believes that all humans have dignity that's intrinsic because they bear the image of God. Do I agree with that statement? Of course. However, Dennis believes that early first trimester abortion is probably not impermissible. It's probably okay. Is that a moral dispute between us or a factual dispute? It's actually factual. Here's why. Dennis does not believe the early human being in the womb is in fact a human being. He believes it's sui generis, it's some other kind of thing. Now that flows out of his Judaism. Now he's factually wrong on that, but what's the nature of our disagreement, moral or factual? Factual. So there isn't a moral difference between us. We actually agree on the moral principle. All humans have value because they bear the image of God. We disagree on the facts, not on the moral principle. Is everybody clear on that? And oftentimes people point to all these cultural differences that in fact many of them are not moral differences. They are in fact issues of fact that we're disagreeing with. Big difference. But there is also a problem here. If society does relativism is true, then whatever a society does, we can't really judge it. And that leads to our second form of relativism you'll encounter, known as society says relativism. This is simply the French social contract. There's no God, there's no church that's above us. We just get together in this room, we form a social contract, we decide what's right, and that's what's right. No, no objective principles. Do you recall the prime directive, any of you Trekkies that are listening to me right now? What is the prime directive? Not to interfere. Do not interfere with an alien culture. And of course, what is Captain Kirk always doing? Interfering, which makes the show interesting. When the Nazis were called into trial at Nuremberg at the close of World War II, you may recall what their defense was. The world court was holding them accountable for their crimes against humanity. And the Nazi officers tried to float an initial line of defense. It didn't work, but they tried it. It went like this. We were following orders according to what our culture said. And the court at Nuremberg said, nope, there's a law above your law. That's not going to fly. But they tried to float the idea that we Westerners had no right to judge their German culture because we were not part of it. They had a right to determine their own culture. No one should interfere with it. That society says relativism. But I think you can begin to see the flaws with it already. If morality is reduced to what society says, can there be such a thing as an immoral culture? No. Jews have their culture, Nazis have theirs, we have ours, we don't judge. By the way, if society says relativism is true, what happens to moral reformers like Jesus of Nazareth, Martin Luther King Jr., and Gandhi? What are they by definition? Evil. That's right, evil. Here's why. What did Southern culture say about segregation and racism in the 50s? That that was okay, right? In fact, it was mandated. We had separate fountains for whites and blacks. You didn't eat at the counter if you were black. We all know the stories. What did Martin Luther King do about that? challenged it. If society sets what's right and what's wrong, and Martin Luther King goes against that, what is he by definition? Evil. But do most people see him that way today? No. 
How about Jesus of Nazareth? Did he go against his culture's morality? Yeah, like kicking dudes out of the temple, claiming to forgive sins, challenging the entire political apparatus of the temple system. You know, when people tell me Jesus never got involved in politics, they have no idea of what first century Judaism was about. The temple was a very political animal, and Jesus went right at it. So the idea that if you challenge your, your culture's morality with moral truth, if morals come from that society, you are by definition evil. Then there's a third kind of relativism. It's called I say relativism. You've all heard this one. Who are you to judge me? Don't you impose your morality on me. How dare you? You're judging me, right? In other words, I say relativism says morality starts with me and only me, and you have no say over what I perceive to be right whatsoever. If that's true, there can be no such thing as an immoral individual. So there's your three types of relativism. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to respond to this? Well, I'm going to give you some tools for dealing with it. The first thing to recognize about relativism is that it's self-defeating. Now, I know it's early. Some of you, the coffee is still kicking in. But I want you to see if you can perceive the problem in the statements I'm about to make. Are you ready? My brother is an only child. Some of you go, that's really cool. Was he on Oprah? I can't speak a word in English. I'm really surprised that isn't resonating. But anyway, let's go on. You're in rare form as usual. Don't take anybody's advice on anything. There is no truth. The Magic are going to win the NBA championship here. So no, just kidding. Now, what, what's wrong with each of those statements? The minute I say them, they're what? They're falsified. My brother is an only child. What does that make me? I can't speak a word in English. Well, I just did. I'm in rare form as usual. If you need help on that, you're in the wrong seminar. And don't take anybody's advice on anything, including that. You see the problem, right? They literally self-defeat. In fact, <laughs> I was in a friendly discussion on social media yesterday afternoon. And this atheist guy jumps in tried to attack me real quick, and it, or attack, no, not attack me, attack a friend, and he said, all beliefs are just superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reminded of that Monty Python scene in the Holy Grail. She made a, she's a witch, she's a witch. How do you know she's a witch? She made a new town to me. Well, I got better, <laughs> you know? I mean, this guy, five, five seconds later, he, he, he posts beneath that. Oops, I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> All beliefs are superstitious, including that one. You see the problem? This was Dr. Phil a few years ago. In one of his major books, he writes, I, I'm trying to think how he, how he put it. Um, All truth is a matter of perspective, including his truth? If so, why should I care? See, it's all self-defeating. I'm a Dodgers fan. This has been painful for a lot of years. And it's really painful this year because I thought we had a good team. And right now, we're so bad that if Clayton Kershaw isn't pitching, we basically lose. But in 1996, when my oldest boys were six and five, respectively, I had a friend who had uh, season tickets to the Dodgers, and he would take uh, his family, except on Friday nights and Saturdays. He was Seventh-day Adventist, and they, don't, they, they observe the Jewish Sabbath, so they don't go to ball games on, on Saturdays. So he would give the tickets to me. And we were going down the Golden State Freeway, and at the time I had a 1986 Ford Taurus, that had two bumper stickers on it. One said we can do better than abortion, the other said some choices are wrong. Just thought-provoking. 
white pickup truck gets right up on my bumper. She's riding my bumper. She's in her late 20s, early 30s, honking her horn at me, flashing her lights. I can tell she didn't like the stickers. She finally goes out and passes me, and as she does, she extends a certain part of her physical anatomy northward to let me know how she felt about those stickers. Tyler, who was five at the time, says something like, look, Daddy, she loves Jesus like we do. She's pointing to him. I said, no, she's not, son. <laughs> Let's talk about this when you're 50. And then she cut in front of me. And here's what her bumper sticker said. Celebrate diversity. I wanna, I'm just going to let that hang out there for a minute. She saw no contradiction between her bumper sticker that said we ought to tolerate everybody's view and her unwillingness to tolerate my view. This is what I mean when I say relativism self-destructs. We're going to put a quote up on the, the screen for you here in just a moment. Let me tell you what this quote is. When it goes up there, don't start reading it yet. There was a pro-life group that took their display to the University of Maryland a few years back. This is called the Genocide Awareness Project. It's a group that's led by Greg Cunningham and the Center for Bioethical Reform. And what they do is they go on college campuses with huge panels depicting abortion. And each panel, um, well, the entire display would be from this floor to your ceiling. That's how high they can stack it up. Now, I want you to imagine 30 signs stacked two stories high in the middle of the quad at the local university, which, by the way, they have taken it to this campus, I believe. Imagine that, and these pictures are airbrushed. There's warning signs saying, if you don't want to see the pictures, don't, don't walk this way. Of course, what does everybody do? They're going to come see the pictures. This guy, whose quote we're going to put up from the school newspaper, University of Maryland, was really ticked at the display, and he tried to play the tolerance card. I'm going to have you read it. Buddy up with one or two people. If there's somebody left out, pull them into your group. You can do three if you need to. But what I want you to do, please be careful. Do not read this looking to refute everything the guy is saying. I'm not looking for you to do that. I just want you to make note where his argument literally self-destructs. And I want you to look for little words that give you a hint that his argument is self-destructing. Because one of the points we're going to drive home this morning is that virtually every time you're in a conversation with a relativist, almost every paragraph they're refuting their own argument and there's a word you begin to listen for that will tip you off that that's what's happening. And you will see it and a few like it in this quote we're about to look at. So, are we good to pull that up at this point? All right. Can everybody read that? Is that readable? Okay. What I'd like you to do is just, you can read it out loud or read it to yourself, but get with someone after you've read it, and I want you to just kind of write down the words that let you know that something's not quite right here, that this thing is self refuting, and then I'll pull you back to hear what you got to say. All right, scholars, help me out here. Where is this guy going off the rails by literally having his argument commit suicide? Give me some examples. I've just seen something gruesome, awful, Repugnant, but I think we should be free to choose it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair. Good. What else? Abortion is a horrible act that should only be reserved for when the health of the mother is in danger or when the circumstances of impregnation were brutal. I think he needs a little grammar help there. But anyway, uh, what do you see about that? What's the. Go ahead. Okay, so he's claiming that morality must be kept personal, that he wouldn't impose his view on others, but what is the purpose of this editorial? <laughs> to do what? 
Tell everybody who disagrees with him that they are wrong. Yes. There are no moral rules, but here's one. You denied me what I deserved as a homosexual, correct? Would that be a fair way to... Yeah. Okay, yeah, agreed. What else? He used the little word must. Okay. If I were in a book giving away mood, I would give you one. <laughs> but that's my morality, and I'm not going to impose it on anybody else. Now, um, you're exactly right. You're precisely right. Whenever you hear a relativist use the word must, his argument is imploding. There are no moral rules. Oh, but here's one. You must be tolerant. Says who? Is that true or just your view? You see the problem we run into here? Yeah, what else did you pick up out of this? You're all very smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he liked to hedge by saying, I feel I would never do this. Yeah, trying to make it subjective while all the while trying to smuggle in moral rules to this whole thing. Um, did you catch how we use the word universal? These are truths I believe are universal. How can a relativist even make a claim for universal moral truths? Where does that come from? Uh, and then I love this. I have developed an unwavering, uncompromising belief that personal morals must be kept personal because no matter how strong my beliefs are, I would never have my moral convictions pressed upon another person. And I am going to write an editorial in the paper to correct all of you who think differently. Yeah, this is the self-refuting nature of relativism. And now you know why it barks so loudly. There's a saying in law school that goes like this. <clears throat> if you have the facts, pound the facts. If you don't have the facts, pound the table and do it loudly. There's a lot of table pounding going on here with people shouting, you can't force your view, I need my safe space, and all the while, they are correcting those of us who they think are wrong. By the way, friends, as Christians, we aren't imposing our views on anyone. You know what we're doing? We're proposing our views in hopes that our fellow citizens will vote them into law, which is exactly how a constitutional republic like ours is supposed to function. Amen. So the idea that we're forcing our views is simply false. We're proposing our views, not imposing our views. Second problem with relativism, it can't say why anything is right or wrong. Mother Teresa, she liked to help people. Adolf Hitler, well, he liked to kill them. Who are we to judge? They just had different preferences. That's not going to work, is it? Third problem. You've never met a relativist who actually lives that way. You've never. You just saw an example. C.S. Lewis said, the very man who tells you there is no right and wrong will complain if you cut him off in line. He'll say these words, that's not, fill in the blank, fair. And Lewis asks a great question, where does this notion of fairness come from? The Bible. How do you get fairness in a world where there's no standard that we judge ourselves by? And by the way, that was the thing that haunted Lewis and drove him toward theism. That he couldn't make sense of that. He had this sense of fairness, this sense of right and wrong, but he couldn't make sense of it with his atheism. And that was one of the things that drove his curiosity toward theism. 
and ultimately Christianity, this whole moral argument. All right, so relativism fails because it's self-refuting, can't tell us why anything is wrong, including intolerance, and you've never met anyone who actually lives as a moral relativist. In fact, the next time someone says to you, you shouldn't force your views on me, you're going to have a two-word response. And by the way, you learned it last night. Well, no, all's a one-word response. I know there's no truth, but I'm sorry, we got to draw the line on that one. When someone says to you, you shouldn't force your views on me, you're very sweetly going to say, as Greg Kokel recommends, why not? Or what's wrong with that? Any answer they give you will be an example of them doing what? <laughs> Imposing their views on you. Why not? What's wrong with that? And by the way, if you ever press the hot button issue of a moral relativist, they will become a moral absolutist very quickly. Very quickly. All right, a couple of things just on the side notes here. This is extra credit, what I'm about to tell you. So you, if you want to just check out, you can do that. All right? It's the only time I'm going to tell you to check out. But you have my permission to totally ignore what I'm about to say to you for the next three and a half minutes. All right? How did we get to this point where our culture is where it is today? It's very easy to think that we as Christians have so utterly failed. The pro-life movement has utterly failed. Abortion's been with us almost 50 years. We haven't made enough progress. We're just failing, right? No. You've got to understand how we got here. If you look at the the history of moral knowledge, and you start tracing it from the Old Testament to where we are now, you see a profound shift from moral realism, the belief that morals are real and knowable, to moral non-realism, where people think it's all up to us. So let me just give you the very quick gallop through history. In Old Testament times, morals are real and knowable, they are objective, and they're grounded in God's holy character. But not only that, they have a very useful application. Some would call it a utilitarian application. God is holy. He gives his people rules, but he tells them, if you do this, you'll live. Choose life that you may live. Then we come up to the Greeks. Did the Greeks believe in objective morality? Yes, absolutely. Aristotle, Plato, Plato said morals are grounded in the ideal world of forms. Aristotle grounded it more or less in in uh, man's rational nature, but then you, you say, okay, fine, what about the New Testament? Is our morals still real and knowable in the New Testament? Yes. Jesus of Nazareth shows up on the scene, the apostles show up on the scene, but here's where it gets really interesting. In New Testament ethics, we don't do the right thing just for duty's sake. Rather, through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we become more Christ-like day by day as we grow in our sanctification. We're justified in an instantaneous act of God granting us pardon because of Christ and declaring us justified in virtue of Jesus. But sanctification continues over time, and, it, and we don't do that in our own power. The Holy Spirit gives us power to put off the old man, put on the new man, put off the deeds of the body we shouldn't be doing, and put on the, the good things we ought to be doing, the fruits of the Spirit, for example. These are things the Holy Spirit enables us to do. Then we get to the Middle Ages. Thinkers like Thomas Aquinas. Did Thomas Aquinas believe in objective morality? Yes, he did. Now, he differed from the Protestant reformers. He put a little too much confidence in man's ability to figure out right and wrong on his own. I get that. But he still believed in objective morality. There had not been a huge cultural cavity develop. Then, in the 16th and 17th centuries, everything falls apart. I know I'm covering this in rapid light warp speed, but I just want you to get the big picture so you don't get discouraged. Along comes David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Hobbes, and others. And here's what they say. If you can't taste it, touch it, feel it, see it, or hear it, it's not real. 
All truth is reduced to what can be measured empirically through the five senses. Can morals be measured through the five senses? No. So what just became a morality? It got moved from the truth column to what? Preference, passions, emotions, but certainly not true with a capital T and certainly not real. Then it gets worse. Along comes the postmodern turn at the start of the 20th century. All truth gets reduced to a matter of personal perspective or language community. Hence, full-blown relativism. Now, why did I just go through that extra credit? Here's why. It's real easy as Christians to get discouraged and look at the culture around us and say, oh, man, it's going to hell in a handbasket. Why, 50 years ago, everything was great. Look where we are now. No, 50 years ago, these ideas had just not had the tidal wave break on the culture like it is right now. What we're seeing with gender confusion, marriage confusion, abortion confusion, human nature confusion is all coming out of what we saw happen when the empirical shift happened and later the postmodern shift. That's just all breaking in on us to where now we have a culture as Dr. William Lane Craig points out, that will accept truth in the hard sciences, but nowhere else. In other words, they're phony relativists. They claim to be relativists, but they actually still want it when it comes to the hard sciences. That's your culture. That's my culture. Um, one last thing, then we'll take a break. Let's say you get asked to comment on gay marriage. Somebody wants to hear from you. And let me just pretend that you're in a classroom and you know the professor really wants to nail you on this. He doesn't think like you do. He's hostile to your Christian worldview and he wants to nail you on gay marriage by painting you to be an intolerant bigot. So he, sing he, he singles you out in class. Okay, Rhodes. Miss Rhodes, what do you think about gay marriage? He knows what you believe. He's absolutely trying to set you up. Here's how you're going to reply. You're going to very nicely say the following before you answer. You know, Professor Smith, I'm going to answer your question, but before I do, I want to know if it's safe to give my view, or are you going to judge me? What just happened? If he unloads on you now, the tolerance card just got taken away from him. I want to know if it's safe to give my view, or are you going to judge me for having a position different than your own? Those magic little words, is it safe to give my view, are quite helpful when you are dealing with a steamroller who isn't interested in rational argument, only in shutting you down. Now, one last thing that will come up, there will be people who say, well, even your Bible doesn't believe in objective morality because I can point to places in there where uh, it appears that God's people were relativists. For example, Pharaoh tells the Hebrew midwives, kill every male child. Do they do it? No. They hide them. Pharaoh gets wind of it eventually, calls him in, says, um, didn't I ask you guys to like kill those children? Do you remember how the Hebrew midwives responded? They said, get this, this is just hysterical. Well, you know, we meant to, but these Hebrew women, they're really robust and they give birth so fast we couldn't do it. Can I translate this for you? They lied through their teeth. There's a knock at the door. It's World War II. You're hiding Jews. The Nazis want to know, are you hiding Jews? You going to tell them the truth? No. Nope. You're going to lie, aren't you? Nope. Does that make you a relativist? Nope. No, it does not, and here's why. Let's say you have two moral truths that collide. They're, they're, they're right here, okay? They, they've hit. It's right to tell the truth. We should tell the truth. 
But in this case, if you tell the truth, evil people kill innocent people. Here's what happens. And here's what the Hebrew midwives did. And by the way, the scripture says that the Hebrew midwives found favor in God's eyes. So let's be clear that God was not displeased with this. Two moral truths collide. You give greater moral weight to the greater moral truth. In that case, that doesn't make you a relativist because you're acknowledging that there's two objective truths. You're not saying there is no truth. You're saying two of them are colliding. I give a greater moral weight to the greater moral truth in this case. That doesn't justify you lying to your boss because you're late for work. It means in that case only, when you had two moral truths colliding, you give a greater moral weight to the greater moral principle. Is everybody clear on what I'm saying here? And that is why I don't use the term, I'm not opposed if you want to use it, but I generally don't use the term absolute morality. I use objective morality. Because if it's absolute, you can never override it. So I'll say objective morals, grounded in the character of a holy God. And it is God's will that we give greater moral weight to the greater moral truth when, in those rare cases, we're called on to do that because they're colliding. 